happy Halloween weekend. I'm Courtney, I'm the tour owner. You are my second tour of the night after reading for five hours to young children, uh, spooky stories. We are praying for my voice to hold out this evening. So your good energy right about here, please. And I believe we can do this. I started this tour in 2006. So you are going to get all the juicy little tidbits that you want. Um, but I, to be honest, I truly can't tell you everything that we have experienced on this tour. I'll give you as much as time allows, and then you can chat with me after the tour if you want more details. Um, I have always begun and ended my tour here at Prospect Terrace Park, and I do so intentionally. Prospect Terrace Park A has parking, which is unique in the city of Providence. We have a beautiful view, which we love, and it also sets the tone. Providence is a city of secrets. It's these little stories that are lying just under the surface that we will uncover this evening. And the story of the park that many people do not realize is that it's not just a beautiful park. It's also the finest cemetery in all the city. Behind me are the remains of Rhode Island's founding father, Roger Williams. If you read the inscription on the monument, it says here reposes dust from the grave of Roger Williams. And Lovies, it's just a little bit of dust, and I'm going to tell you why. Roger Williams came here in 1636. He was initially from England. He popped over to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but he didn't really jive with the Puritans because he believed in religious freedom, so they booted him out. A lot of Rhode Islanders were people who were booted out by the Puritans. That's kind of how we arrived here. Um, so Roger Williams paddled his canoe up the river and by the providence of God found this land. Only he didn't really find it because the indigenous communities were very much already here, but he made friends with them. He set up a nice little home and then other people set up their homes and we had a little village. And then he did the thing we all do, Roger died. And we were sad, we were bummed out. He was a good guy. So we buried him in a lovely spot, not here. We buried him on his home lot, which was tradition. We were burying people right behind their homes so you could pick a vegetable here or there, work on you know a new fence or something and say hello to grandma and grandpa all in one fell swoop. It was efficient, it worked nicely. We buried Roger under an old apple tree. It was a beautiful place to go, fragrant with blossoms in the springtime, heavy with fruit in the fall. Very nice. The village of Providence grew and suddenly we needed new roads and one of those roads was slated to go right over our founding father and we felt that improper so we decided to exhume him but we hit a bit of a snag. You see just as the city of Providence had been growing so had the apple tree and the fruits were so delicious because they were very well fed. One of the roots had found its way into Roger's coffin and had been snacking on him ever since. A root wound its way through his eye socket down his spine hit his pelvis where it split into two raced down his legs and curled up in little feet and so when we went in to exhume the body of our founding father we had a little bit of a game of tug of war and all we could scrape out was a little bit of dust and here it reposes right behind me hiding in plain sight providence is a weird city Keep your let's do this thing This is the Providence Athenaeum. Providence Athenaeum is our private library. We of course have a public library that one can use, but if you'd like to pay a little membership fee, you can come here to the Athenaeum and it is well worth the cost. It's a little bit cold on the exterior, right? It's this sort of cold, stern stone building, but if you enter through those doors, you are pitched into a book lover's paradise. There are these vaulted ceilings. There are skylights that allow the sunlight to filter down two stories of bookshelves, catwalks, and little nooks where you can just whisper poetry to someone you love. And that was what exactly what happened at this library. This was the site of one of Providence's greatest love stories. So if you're here with someone special, get a little cozy. 
The, these two were writers. <laughs> so it was very appropriate that this was a meeting ground for them. The gentleman lived just that way on Benefit Street. The woman lived this way on Benefit Street. So it was also a nice meet you in the middle kind of a place. Now the girl in the story wore black from head to toe. She wore a coffin-shaped pendant around her neck, and she liked to hold seances in her dining room when other ladies were in church on Sundays. I believe we would have been magnificent friends. <laughs> her name was Sarah Helen Whitman, and the legend has it that it was a moonlit night in June, hot, humid, and choking. She stepped out onto her Benefit Street home porch, hoping for a breath of fresh air. And when she found none, she descended into her rose garden. She was smelling a bloom when something caught her eye, walking on the sidewalk. Coming down under the street lamps in the darkness of night was a man, and he had a lovely tortured look on his face that drew her in. This gentleman locked eyes with her and the two fell deeply in love. He was not just an ordinary man, my friends. He was none other than Mr. Edgar Allan Poe, the writer from up the street. Very nice. <laughs> Mr. Poe was kind of the perfect complement to Sarah Helen Whitman. They got together beautifully. First, they began their relationship via correspondence. They wrote lovely little letters to one another, and then they began to stroll through the streets of Providence. They would come here to the Athenaeum to sort of whisper poetry to one another in one of those little nooks and crannies, and they would picnic in the cemeteries. And it was in one of the cemeteries that Mr. Poe got down on one knee and proposed. Sarah Helen accepted conditionally. You see, her mother had her reservations. Mr. Poe had a bit of a reputation for drinking a little too much. And so the condition was that he would cast away the bottle. He would be sober in order to marry Sarah Helen. So the date was set. Mr. Poe was committed to his sobriety until two days before the wedding. They were here at the Athenaeum. They were in one of their little cubbies and they were sort of enjoying a little book together when a friend passed by and slipped Sarah Helen a note. She unfurled the note and she read that Edgar had been drinking the night before and the engagement was promptly broken off. Sarah Helen returned to her home. Fiction and fact probably get a little discombobulated here. Some people believe that Mr. Poe got terribly inebriated. Other people feel he was just overwrought with emotion. Whatever the case, he made quite a commotion. He arrived at her home. He burst through the door. He yelled at her mother, causing the woman to faint. He yelled at Sarah Helen, causing her to faint. She was revived and he was clutching her skirts, begging her forgiveness, pleading her to take him back. But it was not to be so. The engagement was over. She loved him dearly, but they could not marry. Mr. Poe is devastated. He left Providence altogether, ended up in Baltimore, Maryland, and that is where he died under rather mysterious circumstances. You go to Baltimore if you would like to see his burial site. You come to Providence if you'd like to connect with his soul. He has been seen year after year strolling under the street lamps in the dead of night, looking sad and forlorn on his way to Sarah Helen's home. And he's also been seen here at the Athenaeum. This was chronicled in a documentary by PBS called Haunted Rhode Island. It was done in the early 90s. I watched it on VHS tape. That is how old it is. A member to the Athenaeum came through the gates as you just did. He was coming here for an afternoon of study and he didn't appreciate it when he saw a homeless man stretched out on the steps having an afternoon nap. As a social worker, I feel he should have had some empathy for this soul, but he did not. He was clearly not a social worker. Instead, he clapped his hands and he said, hey, you can't nap here, you need to move. <clears throat> The man kind of grumbled at him. He pulled his overcoat closely to his body, snugged in, and did not disperse. The man took it a step further. Hey, I will call the police. You need to move. <clears throat> he growled at him, but he did not get up. So this Rhode Islander decided, all right, Mr. Nice Guy is gone. And he kicked him right in the back. The man stumbled to his feet. He was quite unsteady, but he looked him dead in the eye and he said, the conqueror worm, the conqueror worm, and vanished from sight. 
This man was gone in an instant. It was unthinkable what had just happened. He ran into the library, grabbed a librarian, and described what he had just experienced, and he said it, the Conqueror Worm. And she said, what? He said, yes, the Conqueror Worm. She said, wait here. She went into the stacks and she selected one volume, the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. And there it was in black and white, a poem by our dear friend. And it goes a little something like this. But see amid the mimic rout, a crawling shape intrudes, a blood red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes with mortal pangs, the mimes become its food, and seraphs sob at vermin fangs of human gore imbued. Out, out the lights out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, and the angels all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. No matter how lovely we are in life or how terrible we are in life, it is the humble worm that gets us in the end. Happy thoughts from our Mr. Poe. He is not the only entity here, so I will let you know. They did a wonderful paranormal investigation of this location back in 2018. A local group came, they set up their equipment within, they were allowed to stay the full night. And the activity that they got here was phenomenal. I'm not going to tell the whole thing because it's just too much to share with you. You can certainly ask me questions back at the park. But they refer to this building as a paranormal portal entities can enter and leave it's almost like grand central station for paranormal activity so have a little afternoon here you don't have to be a member they love to welcome guests and keep your eyes peeled dear loves this way please all right we are back where it all began my friends thank you for your patience with me tonight as i arrived later than intended, but I hope that it was worth the wait. Providence is this city that is swimming in secrets. These stories that have been covered up by time that we are uncovering. Voices that are just waiting for us to provide them with an opportunity to be heard. The last story of the park that I will share with you tonight concerns the street lamps. Once upon a time, they were gas, they were not electric, and they had to be hand lit each night by the Lamplighters Brigade. The Lamplighters were uh, city employees who would descend upon the city as evening fell, and on the streets below, they would turn their attention here to Prospect Terrace Park to wait for the first lamp to be illuminated. And then you could watch as lamp by lamp and street by street, Providence came to life for the night. And so it is with this, a little piece of Mr. Poe, because it was under the lamplight that he and Sarah Helen first locked eyes and fell in love, that I will leave you tonight. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for walking with me tonight, and happy Halloween. Thank you. And there you have it, our very first ghost tour, or my very first ghost tour, in Providence, Rhode Island. Courtney, thank you so much, that was awesome. Uh, tell us a little bit how you got into this, and a little bit about your company. Absolutely, so um, I began Providence Ghost Tour in 2006. I was always drawn to the paranormal, so when I was a little girl, my family lived in Vermont, and we uh, bought a very dilapidated farmhouse and began extensive renovations, and those renovations kicked up some marvelous spirits. So ghosts uh. have always been with me. Um, but I decided to start the company. I graduated from college and kind of wasn't sure what to do with myself, but I had been a guide on another local ghost tour a few um, in a different part of our state, the Newport Ghost Tour. 
and I kind of thought, I think I could start something like that. But I certainly didn't want to compete with them. So I right. set it up here in Providence. I did nine months of research. I had a tour partner at the time, so we both you know, collaborated and worked on that. Um, we weren't sure we were gonna find anything. We didn't know what we would uncover and just were amazed at the volume of paranormal activity here in Providence. We were able to corroborate people's reports with historical documentation of why those spirits existed and who they were. So it's been a fascinating unfolding of discovery. Yeah. And and the tie in with Edgar Allan Poe, I was like, wow, I didn't I didn't <laughs> realize that was that he was from here. I didn't everything. know that until we started the tour. I was as surprised as you, so and you offer other kinds of tours as well. I correct? do. You yeah. have to do an investigative one? Right? Yes, yeah, so we started that this year. Uh, we work with a local paranormal investigator, Deb Vickers. She's wonderful. Um, she has a YouTube channel. You can actually find her, which is fantastic, and see the other investigations that she's done. We select a few of the stops on the tour that you just took. And so we use paranormal detection equipment and are able to connect with the spirits. You know and what? Tell her um, I will find her channel and I will add a link to her channel in the video description oh, of this video right down below. That's wonderful. Perfect. Awesome. And how can we find you online? You can find me online, ProvidenceGhostTour.com. So that's the website for the tour. You can find me on Instagram, Providence Ghost Tour. You can find me on Facebook, Providence Ghost Tour. And we just started a TikTok. I'm not great at TikTok, but you can see a few little pieces and bits. Um, Providence Ghost Tour on TikTok as well. Awesome. Also, you can click the link uh, below. It'll take you directly to her website. So if you have any questions, you want to set up a tour for yourself or a group, she'll be happy to help you. Um, Again, Courtney, thank you so much. This was a blast. Chilly, too, but it was also <laughs> a blast. Um, thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, comment below. Better yet, subscribe. You can catch all my videos as I hit the road for the paranormal, urban legends, or whatever might be out there. Thank you again, and we'll see you on the journey. You're doing well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very so much. much. Thank you so much. It was oh, wonderful your hands are warm to too. meet you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is nothing, believe me. <laughs>it's so cold 20 years living in LA huh? <laughs> I'm still adapting to the cold of Austin I'm Ooh. sure yeah